get to the point where your heart is hardened so much that you don't think about guilt at all. And then pro problems set in, right? And then we have those times where it just becomes so obvious that we've, we've got to do what we've got to do to get where we feel like we want to be, to be who God wants us to be. And it, it all started with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were had no cares in the world. They were completely righteous. They were made perfect, God said. And then they sinned. And for the first time ever, a human being didn't want to make contact with God because the human being realized they owed God something because of sin in their life. And shame came in, and they hid, and they clothed themselves for the first time. And, and, and it even, and here's the part you have to, when you think about guilt, we normally don't think about guilt that we have with other people. We think about guilt with God, right? Because we all, there's not a person on the planet, oh, there are people who say they're atheists, but you go anywhere, people that don't know anything about God, they're worshiping something because they know there's, there's got to be a God out there and, and I'm going to worship this or I'm going to worship this. I'm going to do whatever I got to do to feel like I'm doing what I need to do to earn his favor. We, we thankfully know that Jesus Christ fixes that. But God is the one that opens it up so that we can truly love God and love people. We can truly, unhindered by unrighteousness, we can love God and love people because we've got God's love. God opens that up so that we freely and unselfishly and unconditionally can love God and we can love others with that love that comes from God. The freedom to love God and love people, though, is blocked by these four emotions. We're going to be talking about them in these in the next few weeks. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. These emotions, Mr. Stanley writes, are... A debt to debtor dynamic. This always causes an imbalance. There's, a, there's, a, there's somebody owes somebody. And, and who's the person who's in charge who has the most power, you think? The person who's owed, right? And when he looks at these four emotions, he says this. Guilt says, I owe you. Anger says, you owe me. Greed says, I owe me. And jealousy says, what? God owes me. God owes me. And then there's only two ways to resolve the tension. Someone has to pay up the debt or somebody has to cancel the debt. This emotional debt that comes between two people can just grow and grow and grow and cause all kinds of problems in your life. And you carry that from one relationship to another as you go throughout your life. The bigger the hurt, the quicker the destruction of the relationship. Would you agree? The bigger the hurt, the quicker the destruction of the relationship. With the smaller hurts, it's not such a big deal, except they grow and they grow and they grow, and there's more and there's more. They happen over and over and over again. And then a person becomes hard-hearted. They lose their ability to trust. She becomes cold he becomes angry. Your relationship with God and your relationship with people go together. Those are hinged together. There's a reason God says what's most important is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Everything, every single thing you've got. But he says as important as that is what? To love people. Those two go together. If you're not doing good with people, if you've spent your life going from one bad relationship to another, you can't figure out why you can't keep a friend. You, you can't figure out why everybody's mad at you. You can't figure out why you're mad at everybody else. You can't figure out why you've got this bitterness that's in you all the time. You, you just can't figure it out. Look, if you've got a problem with that, then I tell you something. You have a problem with God. You have a problem with God. Now, you don't fix the problem with people first to fix the problem with God, you fix the problem with God and it will fix the problem with people. And God doesn't say, here, figure it out. God does it. He takes care of it. And all we have to do then 
is to accept it. So the first thing on your note there, I think, that's a blank is this. I owe God. I owe God. That's the first guilt that we have to think about. And, and, and this is a debt that we can't repay. This isn't something that we can do on our own. This is something that is paid by God. He's taking care of that. That's, look, at, look, look, at, um, look at Romans 3, 22. We are made, say this with me, right with God. We're made right with God. Why is that important? Because we're not right before Jesus. We're not right because of sin in our life, that we're, we're born into that. Remember, sin's not, a, sin's not a politically incorrect word. Sin means you've missed the mark. It doesn't mean you're a mass murderer. It doesn't mean you've done terrible bad things. It means that you're not perfectly righteous, and because that, you can't have a relationship with God. But we don't have to fix that ourselves. We are made right with God by placing our faith in who? Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've messed up, no matter how many times we've been married, no matter how many times we've been drunk, no matter how many times we've done terrible things, no matter how many times we've just done the little things, we're made right through Jesus Christ, all of us. So we start off with this potential to be worse with sin in our lives, and then, because everybody sins, and then we have the right, we have the ability to be righteous and changed. And it is a change. That's something we have to understand. It's not just a thought process we go through. It's a change. And we're going to see that more here in just a minute. Verse uh, 23, this is a popular verse. Well, I, maybe it's not a popular verse. This is a verse you've all heard if you've been in church any time in your life. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Verse 24, yet God, ready, freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Freely and graciously. You don't have to live according to the five pillars of faith. You don't have to live your life in such a way that, that one day you're going to be measured. And if you measure out more bad than good, you go to hell. Or if you measure out more good than bad, you go to paradise. Or if you measure out more good than bad and, and he, the judge is having a bad day, you can still end up in hell. You don't have that because of Jesus Christ. You're freely and graciously declared righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. He freed us from the penalty of our sins. Now, I want you to get that because as we talk about guilt, there's basically two different levels of guilt. I want to see if I, if I can make this make sense to you. First of all, if you are not made righteous, then you can't be in the relationship with God. And that is, the, that is the penalty for our sins. The penalty for our sins when we leave this earth and we're not righteous for, with God is to spend eternity away from God. The Bible calls that hell. But then there's a guilt that comes from the day-to-day -day living as a Christian. Just from not being obedient. It doesn't mean we, don't, we lose our salvation. What it means is there's a disconnect in our relationship with God. Now, this is what we struggle with the most. And, and if you look at things like, if you look at the current evangelical world that we live in, we've taken a lot of words and we've really watered them down. Love, does anybody really know what love it is? That could be a song, isn't it? Uh, joy, uh, guilt, you just, just name it, you just, just think about grace, you, you just think about the way people look at that and the way they think about that, and, and, and we've got to realize that guilt is a powerful uh, predicament that we put ourselves in that we have to do something about and it can get worse before it gets better and oftentimes with most people it, I can't tell you how many people will come to church for the first time and I'll sit and talk to them and they're 30 something years old they haven't been in church since they were 
15, and, and all of a sudden they're going, you know, my life has just got bad enough that I feel like the only choice I got is to run to God. So it can get worse and worse and worse, or we can decide to get it better. And God paid with Jesus and canceled out the debt. He paid for our salvation. So I owe God, which he pays for. And the second thing is I owe people. That's the guilt that I have with people. How important is that? How important is our... I mean, just think about it. I, I, I grew up in the Catholic Church. And, um, and we, were, we, uh, we did a thing called confession. We, we have a lot of Catholics in here. Y'all, y'all been to confession, right? We, we've talked about that before. And, and, and here's how it worked. And I, and I was only a Catholic until about fifth grade. So I was a silly Catholic that got licks every single day from the from the nuns in the private school. But, but every, every, I think once a week, we had to go to confessional. And, and we would go, and uh, the priest, we weren't ever really sure if it was the priest priest because the, they have a little curtain on it, so you don't know. You know, it could have been, could have been your dad, so you were real careful when you got up there. So, so I would go up there, and, and we would be standing in line. And, and, of course, you never, never want people to know. Remember what Adam and Eve did when they sinned? They covered themselves up, and they went and they hid. And you never really want people to know what you're doing. And that's one of the biggest problems with sin and with guilt. We don't want people to know who we are. So we would stand in line as third, fourth, and fifth graders, and we would make our own sins up. And, you know, because if you told them sins that weren't really your sins, and you could feel okay about that. So, so what would happen is, I would use these sins this week, and then I would use his sins next week, and, and, and we would do that. But there was this, this constant sense of, if I just tell my sins, then my sins go away, and the problems. But, but the problem is, with the sin that we have with people, even though God fixes the sin we have with him, who has to fix the sin we have with people? Now, unfortunately, again, one of those things that we've watered down is, is we believe that if we just say we're sorry to God, then everything is okay. But look, there's people in this room, there are people in this room that have several people in your life that you still feel owe you an apology. They hurt you terribly. I, I was talking to a guy just a few weeks ago, a guy that I've known for years, and, and he was very rude. It was a very rude conversation. And he yelled at me, and he, and he cussed, and he said a few things. And, and, and I said, dude, you're really being rude. I, you know, and he said, well, that's just how I am. He said, that's how I've been successful in business. That's how I've done life. I'm rude, and I'm going to be rude around you, and that's all there is, and you have to put up with it. Well, I don't talk to that guy anymore because he doesn't have to be rude. That isn't how he has to be. But, but what a lot of us think is we've got this sin in our life, and, and as long as we say oh, we're okay to God or, or whatever, then we're okay. But when we owe people, we owe people. And God cares about that. When we do communion, I use this verse a lot. Look at Matthew 5, 23 and 24. So if you were presenting sacrifice at the altar. Now, the reason we use this when we do communion is because when we do communion, we do, by the way, if you're a guest today, we commun- do communion every first Sunday of the month. And, and people come forward and they take communion here. He says, look, Jesus says this. If you were presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, if you're coming to worship God, that's what he's talking about, right? And you suddenly remember someone that you have something against, that has something against you. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So how important is your sin against somebody else to God? It's, it's, It's bad, right? I mean, God is saying, look, if... If you've offended this person and you haven't done anything about it, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, how to go about doing that. If you haven't done anything to fix that, God's going, dude, I'm not, you got time out. Well, my granddaughter hates time out. Lisa will go, Pop, or Brooke will go, Poppy, go to time out. Poppy will go, one minute? She'll go, no, two minutes. Like two minutes is murder on a three-year-old, you know what I'm saying? But, but, but we have to... We can, we can be hard-hearted 
and not even notice that we're hurting or offending others. And that's when you've got to start worrying about your relationship with God. There, there can be trouble in the relationship with God if you have trouble in your relationship with other people. So if, if we look at what guilt is, guilt is I owe God, I owe people, and then the third thing is I owe God. Why? Because I owe people. I owe God because I owe people. And when it comes to making it right with God and with people, the evangelical world has basically just taught Christianity light. As long as you say you're sorry to God and you can go on, and, and, and I can't tell you, I've, I've watched Christians argue this, you know, you, he shouldn't be offended. That isn't, can I ask you something? Who decides what you say is offensive? The person you're offending, right? So that automatically puts you in a sin situation. And, and, and one of the best ways to get to, to do that is if you, if you start really taking the love God, love people approach, you start realizing that the feelings of people and what's going on with people are more important than what's going on in your own, in your own life. Let's look at another familiar verse about handling our sins. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. This is, the, this is that refrigerator verse that everybody grabs hold of to feel good. You know, that, that bumper sticker that says, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the earth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. I have heard people use this passage to argue for not saying they're sorry to somebody or not confessing or apologizing to somebody. But we know, if you look at that in the context of Scripture, we are to confess to God and the offended party. We are to confess to God and the offended party. The biblical confession is not just saying, I'm sorry. Any of you ever had a, a friend or a relative or a husband? Well, I better not say that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't want anybody going, yeah. No, no. There's been people in your life who hurt you over and over and over again, right? Right? And, and what they do is they say, I'm sorry. And then a little while later, they do it again. They say, I'm sorry. A little while later, they do it again. I'm saying, I'm sorry. Somewhere down the road, you get smart enough that you go, I don't think he's really sorry. Right? Because it's not about being sorry. It's, 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 it's about confessing and, 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 and getting rid of our guilt. And, and it's not, confession is not about conscience relief. Look what Andy Stanley wrote in this book. Confession is just one step in a sequence of steps that leads the guilty out of darkness and into the light. It's simply the beginning of a process that ultimately leads to what? Say it with me. Change. Change. It's not just relief that you said you're sorry. It's change. And it, it's not just change in the person that you in you in the relationship with the person that you are talking to. It's also change in the way you relate to God. See, sin is a selfish behavior. And remember, we looked a couple of weeks ago, that secular study that said that people that were willing to do small things wrong. Remember we laughed about, you know, too many items in the express lane and speeding and things like that. The studies show that people that are willing to do little things wrong are the people that are going to be willing to take it to the next level and do bigger things wrong. That, that, that's what we do. So, so We've got to realize if, if we're continuing to do things and we're not willing to ask God for forgiveness and other people for forgiveness, then there's a possibility that it won't be too long that we've built ourselves up to the point where we're doing things that are very, very, very harmful. Can't tell you how many people I've counseled that thought they would never get divorced. We'll never get divorced. It's just never going to happen. It's just, we're just so committed to each other. We just, we just love each other so much. And, and something happens. And it's so, there, there's, there's no way you can simply explain a divorce. 
There's no way. There's, there's so many complications. There's, there's so much stuff that gets you to that point where it finally happens. And, and it gets to the point, and some of y'all in here have been there. You, you know what I'm talking about. It gets to the point where all you're thinking is, is the only way that I'll ever get relief is if this is not happening anymore. And when we get to the point where we're thinking of ourselves that way, we're not thinking about the way it affects so many other people. The guy that is business partners with somebody and he cheats on his partner and he runs off with the money. All he's thinking about is what he needs and how he needs to take care of himself. And he's not thinking about what's going on with other people. We are to confess to God and the offended person. Let's look at confession for just a minute. And I, and I think I left something off your notes. Right above confession... Right, confession dissolves guilt. I think I left that off, didn't I? Right, D- confession dissolves guilt. Obviously, we all think that confession to God is important. Does everybody think that confession to God is important? I want to explain to you how important it is confession to other people in our relationship with God. Let's look at confession itself. Because confession is really like a four-step process. It's, again, it's not just saying I'm sorry. Confession is, first of all, if you just look at the, at the today's definition of confession, because y'all have heard me say this before when I'm talking about becoming a Christian, you've got to decide that uh, you confess to God, you, that you agree with Him that you've sinned. That's the first step. That's what confession is. I'm in agreement that what I'm doing is sin. And unfortunately, I think because of the evangelical world we live in, where the numbers are very important, how many people we baptize, how many people we can stamp their picture on the side of our building, all those kind of things, we think very easily, what's the easiest way we can get this person on the books? Yet it really, that does a disservice because it's so much more. Confession... It's not just about saying we're sorry. It's a, it's a start to changing. It's a start to being different. The, the best way to confession is to do it now. Look, if you want to do something that will really help you in your relationship with God out, start the practice of every time you feel like you did something wrong, confess. It just it, it becomes easy. And what happens is, 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 is when you confess it, it lightens up what's happening and it gets you to the point of thinking more about not doing that anymore. So just confess, whether it's, um, um, I mean, here's something small. I just, this just came, just, um, not too long ago, I was buying something out of a machine and two things fell out for the price of one. You don't know what I'm talking about? Now, I've been around people that have gone, bonus, bonus, I've got to, well, they shouldn't have had two of them fall out. You know what they do? They start blaming the machine and everything. And, 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 and I'll just tell you something. I, I got it, and I looked around. There wasn't anybody there, and I, and I picked it up, and, and it was good stuff, or I wouldn't. It was famous Amos cookies. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm just, you know, they're not very big bags anyway. And I started rationalizing, you know, cheating this guy out. of And, 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 and I, I started to walk off, and, and I got almost to the door and it was killing me I had to confess it I had to stop it I had to you know what I'm saying I mean that sounds silly but if we get to the point where we're confessing the light things we may not ever get to the bigger things and then it becomes much more easier to confess the bigger things we we've got to keep our account short you know when you do something that you know is offensive to your wife apologize and then I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about what you do after you apologize and Lisa would you mind leaving the room for just a little while (laughs) confession gets sin out in the open guilt loses its foothold on your heart the longer you keep the sin in the dark the more it hardens your heart and the more difficult it is to get rid of it when there's sin in your life you can't work it off you can't pay it off you can't do something else to make yourself we try to example um, 
I've, I've counseled lots of couples where the husband or the wife, or, and it's usually the husband, but he's very interested in furthering his career. And what he's decided up front is, whatever they ask me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever they ask me to do, they ask me to work till 12 o'clock, I'm going to work till 12 o'clock. If they ask me to move to wherever, I'm going to move to wherever. I'm going to, and, and let me tell you something. When you counsel those kids and you counsel that wife, I've never, never met a wife who chased her husband around the country that came to the point where she said, you know, I really like this thing. Because they're going somewhere new all the time. They're meeting someone new. The kids are having to meet somebody new. I've counseled all these kids that are adults now who moved every year. They, spent, they went to high school in six different high schools. And, 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 and all that stuff happens. And, and, and we have to think about those things. And then what happens is, is, is a mom and a dad, they decide what we're going to do is we've got to make this up to the kids. We've got to make up the fact that you're not ever home to tuck the kids in bed at night. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them more stuff and we're going to take away boundaries. Just be prepared to start paying a lot of money for counseling when you do that. They need you. And, and you can't make up for those things. And, and that's just, a, and it's the same way with divorce. It's the same way with spending too much of your money. You, you just name it. Time and time again, we do things that it affects the people around us in a bad way. The second thing, you ready? Confess, agree, you say it's bad. The second thing is called what? Repentance. Repentance. Now, if you just look at the regular definition of that, it just says, turn away from and, and go the other way. Repentance is saying, look, I'm giving up doing it the old way, and God now, if you look at biblical repentance, I'm doing up giving it the old way, and God now I'm doing it the way you want me to. Look what 2 Timothy 2.19 says. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord, y'all understand that, right? Everyone who says Jesus is Lord must turn away from Dude, that's like one of those black and white verses. And, and, and remember, we talk about all the time the things in our life that becomes gray when we're not very close to God. If you start praying about the good things and putting the good things in your heart and you're getting close to God, you start seeing things that are wicked. I tell you all this all the time. Brand new Christians come to me and go, man, well, I don't think I need to be doing this anymore. This just doesn't seem right. Well, you didn't feel that way last week. Well, I didn't know Jesus last week. It changes the way we look at things. If, 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 we, if, if we confess in the name of Jesus, it's a change in your life. It's a change and we repent. Look at Luke 24, 60, 46 to 47. Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and raise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that the message would be proclaimed in the authority of His name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. This is forgiveness of sins for all who... It doesn't say for all who say they love Jesus. Remember Jesus was walking with his disciples and he said, he said you know, there's going to be people that say, Lord, Lord, and I'm going to say I didn't know them. He knows us when we change direction and, and start following him. Number three, here's a tough one. Ready? Restitution. Restitution. How do you make it right? How do you make it right? To make it right, you have to make an honest attempt to pay the IOU. That's so important that we confess, that we repent, and that we do restitution. Now, there's a lot of the evangelical world right now that just throws this out the window completely. Y'all remember the guy named Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Wee little man was he... And, uh, and he wasn't, it wasn't bad because he was short. It was, it, was, it was bad because he was a tax collector. You know, and they sing those songs for kids. They're not going to tell him he's a sorry dog. But he was a sorry dog. And, and what happened with tax collectors back then? He was a Hebrew. So here's what Rome would do. Rome would go and they would let Hebrews bid. You want, to tax, you want to collect taxes? You want to, And they would bid, just like you would bid on a contract for a job. And then what would happen is they'd say, Okay, Richard, you've won the contract. You collect the Roman taxes from them, and then anything else you can get from them is yours. You would become an enemy of your friends quickly. 
and they were, they were all dirty cheats, they were bad people. When they're, when they're listed off as bad people, and they're listed along with prostitutes and murderers, and that's how bad of a person that was. So, so Jesus meets Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus becomes a Christ follower. And I just want to read one verse to you. In verse Luke 19, 8, look what it says. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus is all excited now. He's met Jesus, and he's, he's turned his life over to him. He feels so relieved, and now he's going, I've confessed my sin, and, and now I need to make restitution. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord, and he said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. You can't ignore that, can you? I mean, that's there. It's restitution. i got to make this right. I want to tell you something. There are times you're not going to be able to make it right to that person. When, when I do a funeral, I stand before the crowd and say, Look, there are some of you right here, right now, that have regrets because of the way you treated or the things you did to this person who's not here and you never made it right. And I tell them, live your right life right now. Live it right from now on. Make it, make it right as you go. Can confess as you go along. And, and, and Zacchaeus goes, Zacchaeus says, Lord, I will, I, will, I will give people four times of what I've cheated them. And you know what Jesus said? Zach, you don't have to do all that. Dude, you're saved. You're a Christian now. You're better than everybody else. You can look down on anybody who doesn't show up at temple next week. That's not what he said. It's not what he said at all. As a matter of fact, here's what he said. Verses, Luke 19, verses 9 and 10. Salvation has come to his home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. Zacchaeus' salvation came with his repentance and his restitution. The life change. That's where his salvation came from, is, is from that change. This guy is for real. Money talks. He made a sacrifice. We've got to learn to fix it. When we do something wrong, we've got to fix it. Words mean nothing. And the cool thing is, as you go forward and you confess and you work on fixing things, you will think a whole lot more about doing that in the future. Would you agree? It's not the action. It's the action that's backed up by the confession. Over and over, the Bible speaks of confession being about life change and not conscience relief. Hidden sin, unconfessed sin will cause anxiety in your life and will cause you to sin more. The more unconfessed confessed sin you have that causes anxiety in your life, the more you're going to do things to try to make that feel better, which are going to be worse things. Look at James 5. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? What's that say? Do I have that one in your... Sorry. It says, <laughs> write this down. I must have added this this morning. It's really good. Pay attention. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James is saying, look, some of y'all are sick because you haven't confessed your sin. The anxiety. Y'all know. They've done... There are plenty of studies now that say just about any stinking disease on the face of the earth came because of stress in our life, right? You read something new every day. Between heart attacks, cancer, you name it, anything you get has something to do with stress. James is saying, look, if you've got this constant anxiety in your life and it's caused by sin, you need to relieve that. And it'll make you more healthy. Anxiety, depression, it leads to other in other illnesses. And then number four, restoration. If you can, make restoration with that person that you hurt. Uh, make the relationship better. That person may not ever accept that. And again, that will be a reminder of the way you need to treat people in the future. 
but you go forward and you try to make restoration. And I think the best way to think of that is, again, I know in this room, there are people in this room, I, there's, there are people in my life that have never even come forward and acknowledge things that they did that were terribly painful for me. And those are things that come up every once in a while. And when people have done that in my life, some of the most peace-feeling, joy, comfort, I don't know how to explain it. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all have had people that, that person that you thought is never really going to care, never going to, look, they're still out there acting like that in there, but, but, but come forward and, and restore. Confession will break the cycle of sin, it says on your notes there, and confession will dissolve the guilt. And then I want to end with this. Don't forget this. Even after confession and forgiveness, you should always remember the hurt that you caused. You can always look back and say, I never want to do that again. Don't forget, be grateful for the wisdom that you learned and the other chances to do it right from here on out.